Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And today, myself and Jack will be taking on the top 10 decks for the European International Championships being held in London next weekend. I'm of course going to be commentating, Jack's playing, so we've both been testing the new archetypes like crazy. And we feel like we have got ourselves down to a definitive top 10 list. So hopefully this will be an educational and... Uh, important video for you guys all to check out and uh, should be a lot of fun too yeah for sure just before we jump into the top 10 obviously it is going to be a bit of a subjective list a top 10 list always is uh, but we want to know where we got a lot of our sort of initial thoughts from and where a lot of the data's come from as you can see there's three images from the complexity card gaming facebook page on your screen at the moment um after every regional they pretty much do one of these little sort of uh, stats roundup uh, stats roundup things, really, where they create a pie chart of all the top 32 decks. They give some facts about how many people are playing uh, different decks and things like that. So that's uh, been one really, really useful source to us. Another was the Limitless TCG website, uh, which had some information on some of the other regionals around the world, particularly the Brazilian ones. Uh, and then finally, PokerStats was another website that we used uh, when working out what's being see what's seeing a lot of play and things like that. Uh, so all three of those are really, really good sources for if you're ever looking to sort of see what uh, is popular right now, what's doing well, maybe where to start your testing. Uh, so definitely go and check all three of those out after the video because they're all really, really useful. Okay, so let's start off in at number 10. We have Vikavolt Bulu. It is this archetype that attempts to get the stage two Vikavolt out using its strong charge. And it's essentially just going to power up this big beat stick that is Tapu Bulu. Nature's Judgment, when you discard all the energy attached to him, you get to do a 180. That's a huge chunk of damage, and of course that can go up to 210 with a choice band. So you're going to be knocking out a lot of things like uh, Zoroark, Silvallis, Di uh, Ninetales GX, Galissapod GX, and uh, a bunch of other things. Your Grass Typing gives you a decent Greninja. It's definitely strong if you play Fighting Fury Belts, and uh, that could be sneaking back into the list. I know a few people have been trying a split of tools, and I feel that's not a bad direction to go into, although, as I just mentioned, 210 HP is a golden number for so many things, so I'd be surprised if you weren't playing any choice bands. This archetype does sort of struggle a little bit against uh, some of the top tier stuff. Definitely the Garbodor variants are the biggest issue for Tapu Bulu, um, in particular Galissapod and Drampa. I think you might be a little bit better against Boswell because you can uh, Tapu Wilderness away a lot of their early pokes of damage, which is quite good for you. And you're not too worried about a hold devolve overall, as long as uh, you can get one or two strong charges off throughout the game, and you hold off on your big discards until later on. So, um, I think also straight Zoroark would be a big issue if they are playing Zoroark Break, and even the Mindjack Zoroark can be annoying at times because you're so focused on Bridgeting early and making sure you can fill up your bench. Oftentimes, you need a Rangaroo's Leles and multiple Vikavolt in play. So. Um, these are all your sort of awkward matchups, and I think also bundled into that, one of the big selling points of Vika Volt Bully was that it could take on Guardi. Uh, the big selling point being that you can discard all the energy from yourself every time when you're up against Guardi, so they have to commit a bunch in order to deal with you in one hit. Uh, and especially that was the case when you could use a Tapu Koko to flying flip uh, earlier on in the game. Uh, to set up the 20 damage all over the board so then Bulu can take one shots with a choice band. Uh, that may not be the case anymore because Mr. Mime is more likely going into the likes of Gardevoir lists. So for our top techs, I've recommended Professor Kakui, potentially multiple in your list. So you can just do a straight up 230 with a choice band, Kakui, and discarding all your energy. That's probably going to be the main way I think Bulu players will look to adapt. I think there are some other cool techs that you could try out, like Pheromosa and Zerkatry. Um, I don't think they're hugely consistent, and uh, Bulu simply has to be as consistent as possible. It needs to have a really high count of field blowers. It needs to make sure it gets a Rangaroo, make sure it has a high candy, high ultra ball, even like heavy ball and high Skylar count. These are all super important things, so if I was playing Vika Bulu, I'd go as tech-free as possible, but Kakui seems to be the standout card that you almost need to play now if you're going to be heading into London. Yeah, for sure. I think Guardi is going to be one of the most popular decks there, so being able to um, still have an out to one shot in Guardi's is really important, and as you'll see when we get to the Guardi slide, we are suggesting Mr. Mime as a tech right now, so it's not like it's an unknown tech that people won't be playing. It's something that a lot of the community is talking about, 
Um, so you do have to ad adapt because of that. I think taking uh, not necessarily the complete loss, but having a rough ability lock matchup is always going to be difficult. Um, so, th but there's there's this kind of theory with this deck, which when it gets set up, it kind of doesn't need anything else. That's why you can run multiple copies of Kakui because honestly, the deck is the deck sort of thins itself with strong charge. Uh, so you're always finding energy that way. So as long as you can just not have completely dead hands and you're able to find multiple Bulus throughout the game, you really don't need much more. So whilst it's still pretty low on our top 10, uh, it's a deck that when set up, it just steamrolls things. So you have to at least consider it somewhat for things like for big tournaments like London, where you can just win matchups outright by setting up, which is really, really strong. Next up, we have Decidueye GX. Obviously, Decidueye... Uh, oh, and the variants sort of around Decidueye. Obviously, it's seen a little bit less favour since uh, Forest rotated, but I think we've had enough time in Standard without Forest to the point where people are starting to optimise builds a little bit. Um, but the best thing about Decidueye is, is it's pretty much completely splashable, which is really, really nice because you don't often attack with it anymore. It's re it's actually a really inefficient attacker now you can't get it very early. Uh, so you're looking at attacking with other things, as you can see on the screen right now, pretty much all of these other cards other than Decidueye are brilliant attackers to pair with Decidueye, um, so, which makes Decidueye pretty splashable. All four of the cards on the screen are different types, so yeah, Decidueye is a great splashable Pokemon despite being a stage two right now. Had some decent recent performances, two Desi Tails uh, in Hartford and one in Bremen. Again, this was towards the earlier part of the format before things like Zoroark and Buzzwall came out. Uh, I think Zoroark and Buzzwall are two of the best partners for Decidueye right now, without a doubt. Um, so that's why it perhaps hasn't done as well in the more recent tournaments because it's only I feel it's improved a lot uh, since Shining Legends and uh, Crimson Invasion have been released as an archetype overall. Um, but yeah, we against all of these sort of evolution decks, you are going to have a really favourable matchup uh, simply because you can devolve things and being able to devolve right now is really really strong. Gardevoir is going to be hugely popular as I've just said when talking about Tapu Bulu. Um, and it is a stage two that likes the rare candy and start applying pressure really quickly a lot of the time. Uh, so just having to do 60 damage instead of 230 is such a huge weight off your shoulders. And with multiple Decidueye up, you can actually get that really, really easily. Especially when pairing it with things like Jet Punch or Riotous Beating. You can be Riotous Beating the active um, for, for with not many Pokemon on the board at all to be able to, to still be doing enough to be able to devolve them. Uh, for a knockout later on in the game, whilst sort of dealing damage to the bench as well, which is really, really good. Again, Zoroark and Sil Valley, all of these decks um, all, all kind of struggle to deal with the Decidueye's 240 HP as well, uh, meaning that they have to leave these 240 HP uh, Decidueye's on the bench, constantly dealing an extra 20 damage per turn. Um, if they're trying to take them out, they're not taking out your main attacker, uh, which is just dealing even more damage. So Decidueye's definitely still got um, sort of some merits to it, Unfortunately, things the fact that Decidueye has slowed down uh, means it does sometimes lose to quicker decks now. Um, Buzzwell Garb, again, because you're an evolution deck yourself, uh, you're also kind of susceptible to things like Buzzwell devolving you. Uh, but when they can also pair that with Garbodor to stop you feather arrow arrowing and trading and things like that, uh, it is pretty awkward. Volk has weakness on you um, and can really apply pressure in the early game. Uh, especially on things like Rowlets and Dark Trick, simply because they have weakness, so they just need one steam up or uh, a Fury Belt or things like that. They don't need to apply, uh, they don't need to find many many things at all to sort of uh, overcome you. And then Greninja, you wouldn't think Greninja had a uh, had a bad matchup. Greninja was like Decidueye's free matchup back in the day, um, but now because you're also a stage two, you can't apply as much pressure in the early game to the point where the Greninja player can then set up and overtake you. The fact that they're one prize attackers usually means that they can swing the prize trade back in their favour overall. Um, so yeah, despite it being sort of a free matchup before, um, it's kind of gone the other way around, and you're now a little bit too slow to deal with Greninja if they do get set up. So uh, it's kind of awkward. Overall, top techs, Latios is a really, really nice, uh, very splashable tech right now. Obviously, if you're playing the Buzzwell variant, um, you've kind of got that attack anyway. But Latios still does hit Buzzwell for weakness, and that's one of the main things... Um, that Latios is really, really good for. But in things like uh, Zoroark Decidueye, you're running for DCE anyway, uh, so Latios is a completely splashable attacker. You're going to be hitting your DCEs, so be it, being able to deal with Buzzwall uh, in the Zoroark variant is really, really good because obviously Buzzwall has a really, really nice time against Zoroark with that weakness. So having your own non-EX attacker that can actually 
deal a huge chunk to Buzzwall for one and it well, for one DCE is really really nice for truck kind of swinging the price rate back into your favor overall. Yeah, I really like the Latios. It also hits for weakness on the Garbodor stuff, which is also really good. So, um, yeah, I think the Zoroark Decidui is probably my favorite build. It's the one I've been testing the most, just because once you start getting your stage ones online, it then enables you to get multiple Deciduis up uh, in the most consistent way possible, because you can start trading to hit your rare candy combos, which is really good, and you have the built-in end proofing mechanism. And just having that nice 210 HP is really good for Ace of Roller bouncing, which is also just very good in Decidueye builds. Yeah, as you said, Greninja, you wouldn't think it's that bad just because you're a grass type with that much HP. But especially if people are going with Michael Long's list where they have Tapu Fini GX, that is a lot of work that you've done to get rid of a Decidueye. Uh, just with one single attachment on their end and it buys them turns to evolve up and that's really bad. And typically they're packing two enhanced hammers as well. And that could also be really awkward for all of your attackers. I think um, if I was going into London, I think I'd definitely go for a Zoroark build. But the Buzzwell one has also had some speculation around it. Personally, I think that one would just be too weak to Garbodor in general. Because not only is the Trash Launch really hurting you for weakness, you're also really hurt by the ability lock as well. So um, Zoroark seems to be the most well-rounded build. And I think there's still something here. The recent performances don't really tell enough of a story because the deck is so much better now that you have Zoroark inbuilt, I think. In at number 8, we have Greninja. Greninja, of course, got the second place at Hartford as well as a top 8 in Vancouver. So it's had a couple of breakout performances, but really that is how I like to think about it. They're breakout performances by one or two players in the community. It's not being played heavily and not being played to much success overall. I think just because they've had these couple of breakout performances, many people are overestimating this archetype and they feel it has incredible matchups all over the board, which as you can see, having like a good Guardi, a good Zoroark, a good Volk, a good Decidueye, these are all great, but you still have to remember that <laughs> under the unfavorables, I've put the most relevant things in capital letters. Itself is its biggest enemy. Um, you can just lose rounds because of prizes, because of dead hands, because of Greninja jank. I honestly think um, it's just a huge factor in Greninja. I personally would never play the deck, but it's still in at the number 8 spot just because of previous performances and the fact that it does have inherent favorables. And when you flip over that Froakie and you see a Rolts, you're going to feel pretty happy. And that's one of the only few decks in the format that can actually do that, so that's pretty incredible. For top techs, as I said, I'm a fan of Michael's list. The Lele and the Fini, they help you out. Tapu Lele definitely just means that you have like five or six more outs in the early turns um, to actually get yourself into a supporter, get you into the game. And the Tapu Fini really is good at just dealing with any threat that the opponent's built up that you can't otherwise deal with with Greninja. And it also buys you a turn of evolving on your bench as well, help, helping you get into your Greninja break pieces at the same time. Now, if you happen to lead any of these cards, it can be really bad for you. And it can actually sometimes be game losing because you have too many two prize Pokemon on your board. But if everything's going smoothly and you're actually able to get into the game in the first place, oftentimes that powerful board state that Greninja can present itself is too much to deal with. And uh, Giant World Shuriken is still, at the end of the day, an, a, an absurd ability. And Shadow Stitching is still very good in the format. So there's still plenty to like about Greninja. It's matchups are the biggest selling point for me, but inherently, I don't think it's the best 60 cards that you could be playing at a tournament. Yeah, Greninja's kind of got a special place in uh, my heart. I, I still love Greninja, but I think it's super, super risky for um, a big tournament like Internationals. We've got um, debatably one of the easiest world's like, points limits this year, and it would feel really, really bad to sort of throw away a 128 just because you played Greninja that could have taken you all the way to 32 but didn't because you prized fr uh, Frogadiers in three of your nine rounds so you weren't and then you lost a bad matchup so then you like you don't do well because you've kind of had awkward prizes a deck you're playing a deck that like hurts itself more because of the prizes so it feels really really risky but it also feels like a deck that could take you all the way to 32 just because you're hitting these really good matchups and you're having some luck and you're able to set up just even setting up one or two Greninja can give you enough time to set up more and kind of snowball from there. Um, the fact that it, we've put Unfavorables as itself is the biggest 
sort of downside for this. I've played Greninja at an Internats before, and it wasn't the most enjoyable experience. Um, but I think there are people that are diehard Ninja fans, and I think that those kind of people will do well with the deck. And that doesn't mean to say other people won't, but it feels like a very, very risky 60 to be playing, like Joe said, um, when theoretically 128, like one, if for Europe, 128 is 40% of your invite, and it feels like more than ever we should be playing safe right now. Um, and Greninja feels like the opposite of playing safe. But that being said, I can almost guarantee there will be X amount of Greninjas in top 32 because people will run hot with the deck. And when the deck runs hot, it is unstoppable. It is really, really strong. Having ability lock and actually doing a hugely relevant amount of damage at the same time uh, is just really, really strong. So yeah, there will be Greninjas in cut, but I personally won't be going anywhere near Greninja again for an Internats, I don't think. Next up we have Zoroark, someone new from Shining Legends. Uh, a little bit different with these new archetypes. Instead of um, talking, about, uh, talking about recent sort of success and things like that, we're going to be talking about uh, the best kind of builds you can be playing because there hasn't been too many tournaments since Shining Legends have been out and obviously Crimson Invasion is legal as of the day of London, so there hasn't been anywhere uh, Zoro or any of the Crimson Invasion cards have been legal at all. So we're going to be talking slightly differently for these slides. Um, but yeah, Zoroark is a fantastic card. Trade is one of the best abilities, or best draw abilities we've got in the game. Uh, right now, I think it's a really, really strong ability, especially in a format that is slowing down. Being able to get stage ones out is not too difficult at all. The fact you've got baby Zoroark as well is really, really nice as a, non, a, a natural fit for a non-EX attacker, which again is another important thing right now, being able to sort of sway the prize trade. Um, Fey rules, obviously, we can see there. Drampa Garb uh, is always going to be a popular deck and having a good favorable Drampa Garb is really nice. Having two 10 HP uh, means that if they, if they don't, if you're able to bounce the Potown, they're in, it's pretty much impossible for them to one-shot you because you also have resistance to the Garb as well. Uh, plus you can also trade your way into drawing cards without having to sort of discard a lot of items through Sycamore. You can trade into your energy and things like that whilst discarding things like Pokemon so Garb isn't even getting too powerful. Volk, again, is often a deck that kind of Feels it's bored, meaning that Zoroark, Baby Zoroark is a really, really strong uh, non-EX attacker in the Volk matchup. Um, and you can also kind of trade two for two with the early Volk, uh, early Baby Volks if you're playing things like Kukui to be able to deal with, um, to be able to reach over that 120 marks and sort of apply pressure really quickly. Considering you're a DC attacker, it's really, really nice. Being able to trick the GX uh, to just blow up one of their attackers as well is really, really strong. And similarly with uh, Vika Bulu, being able to trick the GX and Zoroark break um, using their attacks against them is really, really nice. Gillespod Garb is a bit more awkward. Again, uh, you find it difficult to sort of one-shot them, and they also find it difficult to one-shot you, uh, but they're often running a sort of more cycle, more Acer Roller kind of bounce cards to uh, sort of negate your damage, essentially. And the whole Espeon combo doesn't really work against them very well. Uh, because they have, they are often bounced so frequently, it's very rare that they're going to leave a damaged Galissapod on the board. Buzzgarb, again, you have weakness to Buzzwall, and uh, Buzzwall is, I think, one of my favourite cards of the new set. It's inc an incredibly strong card, um, and meaning that, like, sort of being able to set up a Zoroark for a two-hit knockout while setting up something on the bench for a Devolution knockout is really, really strong. There's not many cards Buzzwall can do that against. It's often just the Devolution strategy completely. Uh, but with Buzzwall Garb, you're actually able to one, uh, get to the point where you can easily two-shot Zoroark, which is really, really difficult uh, for you to deal with because, you again, you can't really one-shot them after the first tricks the GX or whatever. And then Greninja, we mentioned it with um, when talking about Greninja itself. It's a deck that, uh, when you sort of get set up, um, you can just sort of steamroll things. Riders beating caps at 120, uh, which is a really, really awkward number for the regular Greninjas. Um, and then they're able to snipe their way into either Shadow Stitching to set up for a snipe next turn to knock you out, or just snipe their way into being able to knock you out with Shadow Stitching next turn, uh, which is really, really difficult to deal with. I think overall, the two best builds are the straight build or the counter energy build, if you're not considering sort of Decidueye um, as a build. I, I think this is more focused on Zoroark itself. Uh, I'm personally more of a fan of the straight build. I think counter energy still has a lot of creases to be ironed out, um, but that's because I haven't been able to put too much time into testing Counter Energy. Uh, I think it is ready to be broken, it's just whoever breaks the card um, will be the, will be really, really successful. But I think, uh, personally, I've put a little bit more time into straight Zoroark, 
Baby Zoroark is still a really, really strong attacker. And Zor again, with Zoroark break, it's crazy kind of what these cards kind of sort of faded out of existence when rotation came. Uh, but I think they're actually really, really relevant attackers. And I think a lot of people uh, have kind of forgotten about them to the point where you can really, uh, you're really reminded of how strong card uh, attacks like Mind Jack and Foul Play are uh, in the format right now. Yeah, I agree. And one of the main reasons why it's even more potent when you have Zorak GX in the back is because you can actually afford to play two to three Kikui in your list and it actually comes off because you've managed to draw into your combo via trade so you don't have to keep digging for DC and hope that you hit both cards on a really lucky hand. Uh, you can have those combos readily available to you. So Mind Jack gets into silly numbers quite often. Again, we're still in this Bridget heavy format and uh, Zoroark plus choice band plus kakui plus stadium can start doing silly things so i do think that build is still the best way to go counter energy as well it's something that i've put some time into and i still need to put more time into but i think it could well be the best build available it's probably the best counter energy deck we have available that much i will say um because you can trade into once again these combo pieces typically you'll be playing three or four different sort of type coverage basics to try and help you out against a bunch of different matchups then you'll play something like two to three rescue stretchers to try and recycle them in the correct matchup. And um, being able to trade and actually efficiently get into your counter energy combos is really cool for just blowing up things like uh, Guard of War GX with Kabalion, using Mimikyu to copy big attacks. Even Pseudo Wudo could be used for things like mirror matches and Sil Valley builds. So um, there's a few very good counter energy style Pokemon that we can cash in on. And I think Zorark makes it the most potent. Quick note on the Ninetales, you can see in the top left there as one of the partners. This has been discussed a lot, and in League Cups, this has been played a lot. The sort of combination of Ninetales and Zoroark. Basically, people taking out Artillery, putting in Zoroark GX, and 100% I agree that the Ninetales is a better deck inherently now that you have Zoroark in it. But I always felt that Zoroark was almost stealing the show, stealing the limelight from the Ninetales in that, in that deck. And I ended up just going down a heavier Zoroark route and just cutting the Ninetales down thinner and thinner. And really, I don't think Ninetales helps out many matchups anymore, especially because um, there's going to be Mr. Mime running around a lot more than ever before. Ninetales and Coco, these things are actually devaluing now that um, Buzzwall's out. It's forced the meta to change. It's forced uh, Mr. Mime into some players' lists. And even if they're not playing Mr. Mime, sometimes they'll be playing Max Potions or other things like this to try and get around these sorts of Po-Town sniping approaches. So I personally think the Ninetales build is actually like not great. I think that there's much better Zoroark builds out there and Ninetales itself isn't in our top 10 at all. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. It's definitely been a deck that's been discussed a lot and I know some people have it very high on their own lists, but personally in what I've seen so far and what I've tested with the new Ninetales, I've not been too impressed. I think Zorak is just so impressive that I want to focus more on him uh, because Ninetales itself doesn't really cover you against the weakness of like Buzzwall well enough. Uh, you could just play other things like Latios and Heavy Choice Band Count, for example. These things are probably going to be more potent for helping cover Zorak's weaknesses than another Stage 1 that is also weak to Devolving. Bit of a rant there, but yeah, that's my thoughts on Ninetales Zorak. I know a lot of people have been talking about it. On to Volcanion now in at number six. This got first place and also a top eight in Hartford as well as some nice top 32s here and there and another top eight in Brazil. It's still a very potent archetype. I think the best shell that we could take is the one that Igor played to that first place finish. Um, if I was to make any changes, I would add in a Kiawe and a Ho-O because we've just seen Garbodor basically go on from strength to strength since um, Hartford. And if you're not playing Ho-Oh -Oh and you're not playing Kiawe, Volk actually has like an unfavorable. If it does play those things, I think it has, you know, like a 60% against all the Garbodors all round. So um, you can definitely ramp up your way to beating down Garbodor decks, which is very, very appealing for this archetype. It's not even listed as one of our favorables, the Drampa Garb or the Buzzwell Garb. But I think if you are going to play Kiawe Ho-Oh, I think both of those gain favorables for the deck. And that is very appealing for this archetype. Uh, alongside Sil Valley and Decidueye, neither of them can really keep up with the just ridiculous damage output you can chuck at them. Glissapod Garb has typically always had a pretty awkward matchup against you. So um, 
picking up the other Garbodor builds as other favorables is going to be really good for you. And you're still a basic uh, GX and EX shell. Uh, you are playing like 15 energy. That's where your inconsistency comes in. But um, at the same time, that fire energy is exactly what you need to keep steaming up, keep attaching every single turn. Um, allowing you to do these crazy combos with Baby Volcanion, still the star of the show against a lot of these other um, decks that evolve into these big stage twos, but they just have these little 60 HP basics that you can cash in on very early. So I still think Volk definitely has a place in the format. It's still consistent. It's still just a hard hitting deck. And uh, its unfavorables include Gardevoir, which is probably the big reason why people will shy away from the fire deck in London. I think it is definitely a risk, even if you are playing two Enhanced Hammers, which I believe is probably mandatory at this point. I still think Gardevoir will definitely be a tricky matchup. Um, Greninja as well, although we saw it uh, win in the finals in Hartford itself, I would still have you fairly unfavoured overall. Even with things like Fighting Fury Belts, I don't think it's oftentimes enough, because it's hard for you to maintain using Bright Flame or maintain your steam ups in general. I think you should have an awkward matchup there. And also Zoroark, if they are playing the counter energy build, they could be playing Keldeo or Mimikyu. These both could be really awkward for you. And if it's the straight Zoroark build, they have Mind Jack and they have the Trickster GX and the Zoroark Break. All of these can sort of do two for ones or just take big blow ups, uh, even if it is a two for two on the Trickster GX. These are things you have to worry about. So not quite flawless for Volk. It does have some bad matchups, including Gardevoir. So I wouldn't expect this to be as popular as it has been previously. But it's still one to keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, definitely. Volk's another deck that kind of can steamroll out of nowhere. And just it, it just needs to draw well to be able to beat anything. Um it's it's beaten, like we've said, it's beaten its unfavorables in the match in the past. It just happens to be that um one of its unfavorables is, is going to be an incredibly popular deck. So that's why Volk probably uh, feels quite low to some people. Um but yeah, I think also, like other than the Kiawe Ho, just making sure the only thing that um, I had dispute with in the first place list was the one field blower. Having multiple field blowers is really important right now. We said how um, Garv has gone from strength to strength. I've been like I've kind of been at a minimum playing two in my list, mm -hmm. but have flirted with even having three at a time just to have like the access to them. It's a really really important card to be able to uh, keep up with these Garb variants and like we said it can tip it into your favor if you are able to deal with them so yeah um i think volk is probably the lowest it's been in a while for us um as a deck but just having that unfavorable guardy is what is go going to kind of put people off the deck perhaps um but it's a like i say it's a deck that can just win games through setting up being able to hit volks early and steam up for two for ones and build up two ex attackers that can just take four prizes uh, after dealing some really really early pressure so yeah definitely still a really really strong archetype i think just uh, not as strong as it has been in the past next up we've got another new contender here so valley gx um is another really really strong card from uh, uh crimson invasion uh, gyro unit i think is actually slowly becoming one of my favorite abilities in the game it's so so useful um ha having all of your basics have free retreat uh, it's just really really strong uh, having inbuilt ex energy acceleration is really nice while still doing a really good strong uh, chunk of damage. Two shots pretty much everything. And then Rebel GX is just that, one of those blow-up GX attacks, which is always nice to have access to at some point in the game. Uh, we've put Cabalion and Registeel on the screen here because this is pretty much how we feel Sil Valley uh, is best played right now to be able to have this metal package to deal with Gardevoir. Um, it's actually one of the best Guardi counters right now if you do play the Metal Package. And having Giratina promo can flip that, uh, can sort of make sure that Greninja matchup uh, is favorable, uh, which is really, really nice. It's a nice one of inclusion that can really, really help. Uh, we've also said Zoroark. Uh, we've also included Zoroark in our favorables. As we said, it's difficult for them to um, sort of quite trade as efficiently um, because we're also energy acceler uh, using energy acceleration. And we're also able to blow them up with Rebel GX. They can do the same to us with their Trickster GX because they can copy Rebel. Uh, but they, we need, I think, inherently less overall because their whole board, sort of whole draw engine is having multiple Zoroarks out. Um, whereas we just need sort of a couple of Sil Valley and then a Registeel uh, to kind of be able to see us through the game in that matchup, I feel. So we can play around our own GX attack a little bit more, which is nice. Unfavorables. 
as we said with Volk, you're just not able to keep up with the pressure that they can apply. Uh, some decks just can't do it, and Silvalli is one of those. Buzzwell Garb, Buzzwell having weakness on Silvalli is, uh, again, as I mentioned with Zorark, it's really, really strong being able to two-shot things as well as setting stuff up on the bench, and Buzzwell does not have an issue with that. Plus, being able to actually one-shot type nulls in certain situations is really, really strong as well. And then Vikabulu, as we said when talking about Vikabulu, they can hit that 210 mark. Um, and again, if they're hitting that 210 mark, we're not able to apply enough pressure. If you're sort of trading two for two, uh, sort of two shots for two shots with them, it's a lot nicer because you're also setting something up on the bench. And we have late game non ex attackers. But a lot of the time, they are going to be able to reach that 210 mark uh, to be able to sort of pressure you into having to set up a second Sil Valley just to deal with the first Tapu Bulu. For them to be able to then respond with that second Tapu Bulu. And at that point, you're two prizes down and they just need to take one more knockout for the game. So uh, whilst Vika Bulu, if they, I think if they miss their choice bands and things like that, it can be a completely fine matchup, but the fact that they only really need to find choice bands throughout the game, um, that sort of as a non-essential card, com like usually compared to their setup, means that Silvalli can have a bit of a rough time against Bulu overall. Yeah, I agree. I really like Sil Valley. It's been impressing me. It was one of the decks that I first profiled. It was one of the ones that I wanted to get the testing in with early because my suspicions were correct. And it is definitely a good archetype that can just have energy on the board throughout the game. And that inherently means that you're not super weak to N. You'll play a Rangaroo anyway, and uh, you'll play a high field blow account regardless. So you're an ability focused deck, but only to the extent that it sort of helps you out during the game. So you're not actually that weak to Garbodor variants either. The Buzzwell one, yes, that's pretty awkward. You do have Psychic Memory that can maybe balance it, but it's still bad for you. And then against Drampa Garbodor, you have both memory tools, which are both super useful against their main attackers. You can one-hit KO uh, the um, Espeon GXs, and you can one-hit KO Drampas. Uh, so really, I was close to putting that as a favorable matchup as well, but it's really down to how many of those tools you play and at what points you hit them. Uh, obviously, the more tools you play in general, you'll increase the Garbodor output, which can hurt you a lot in the late game. But um, I think one of the key cards for this deck could actually be playing one or two Skylars to make sure you can actually access the correct memory tool in specifically those matchups. It also allows you to get Field Blower as well, which is really important, not only to enable Gyro Unit, but also to get around, once again, the Potown to keep you out of Drampa 1 hit KO range. Uh, you do have McGinn EX that can sometimes even make you immune to the Righteous Edge um, effective attack as well. So there's a lot to jam into Sil Valley. I think there's space for these one-offs like Giratina. If you do that, I mean, those three favorables look really good to me. And I think your Drampa Garb is 50-50, maybe even 55% in your favor, as long as you play the Skylars to hit those tools. So it's a new sort of rogue archetype. I'd love to see people start bringing the Sil Valley. It's definitely my favorite uh, build of it and I think um, it could definitely be one that shows up. Um, the Metal build does still struggle with Gallade, this is still an issue, but you really have to play it very differently. You basically don't power up Silvalis, you power up just your Metal Pokemon and Silvalli sits on the bench as a tech. So if they are going to go for a Guzmo play with Gallade, you'll have other attackers to deal with him and then you're still a board full of Steel types. So I think uh, just because it has fighting weakness doesn't mean this is inherently a bad card. I think it's definitely worthy of its fifth spot. In at number four, however, we do have the big fighting guy himself, Buzzwall. In combination with Garbodor, uh, I've tested a lot of this on the streams over the last like two weeks. Again, this was one of the first cards I pulled, and therefore it was one of the first cards I tested. I think I've got to around 100 games now with all the different Buzzwall Garb variants, and... Um, yeah, I'm still super impressed with this archetype. I think it is... Basically, if I could define it as an archetype, I would see it as a Galissapod deck that is just a more consistent build. And that's a really impressive thing to say, really. Um, overall, you're doing less damage, and that's potentially why it's not as good, and also it has a bad weakness. Um, but it's definitely a more consistent build than Galissapod Garb, and it's very similar in its shell that you will be most likely using Acer Rollers to bounce this big 190 HP basic, keeping single energy attachments all over the board, making it hard for Guardi, especially with these spreads, and uh, you can devolve all of the evolution decks. You have weakness on Zoroark and Sylvalli. 
and uh, you have ability lock to fall back on which really helps you out overall i think even with ability lock you're not great against volcanian decks because once they hit their field blowers um it's going to take you like a lot of jet punches to actually go through all of their big attackers and even a shell trapping um what's it called uh turtonator is really really bad for buzzworld that's what i found um because obviously a lot of your incentive is to go for a Cerola bouncing and the shell trap damage stays on the board and that's really bad for you so i think volk is one of your harder matchups as the buzzworld garb vika bulu as well in a similar vein to the volk once they hit their field blowers they have a lot of time to cash in on the one or two turns of abilities they actually have because you're so you're really focused on two and three hit KOing, which is just a lot harder for you when they actually break the lock so i think it has a few unfavorables that it has to work out but just early pressure early jet punches win so many games the amount of times that i win within like six to ten minutes is so appealing that you can win best of threes in london and you can uh, really do it quickly because you just steal games from people that have non-ideal setups or that just can't deal with this sort of pressure there are plenty of decks that simply fold to it even ones that do play mr mime you establish garbador on turn two they've put a useless pokemon on their bench at that point that's something that could have been a Rolts. it could have been another one of their basics but now it's just sat there for the rest of the game and you're going to keep punching away at the other stuff that's remaining on their bench so yeah i think it's really potent very powerful from my testing i tested a lot of the zygarde builds and i think that does have a lot of potential i normally found myself running out of steam if the opponent is able to deal with the early pressure and you need to basically make sure you keep having attachments every single turn in the zygarde build and sometimes after a dodgy n you can be left stuck doing not a lot um that's why i think the rainbow garb is probably still the best way because trash launch is you know the best late game card in the game uh so if you're able to establish that and as long as you have that thick trubbish line the thick garbador line it's just going to get you into Garbatoxin as quickly as possible and give you a good backup attacker overall. Yeah, I've also done a lot of Buzzwall testing with um, sort of Garb, not uh, not Trash Match Garb, but Zygarde. And I completely echo what Joe says, you need to hit an energy every turn. And if you don't, you really do run out of steam. So I think in the minimal testing I've done uh, with Trash Match Garb, it has still impressed me. Um but yeah, I think Buzzwall is an insanely strong card. It's without a doubt my favourite card of Crimson Invasion, um, simply because it just reminds me so much of Landorus EX. And Jet Punch really, really is oppressive. When Guardi is debatably the best deck in format, being able to set up two Guardies to devolve, to be ready to devolve them um, by turn two sort of gives you an, un, an, an sort of unofficial win condition at that point. Because if you're able to take four routes off the board, uh, in, in sort of taking two prizes early and then devolving two later on. They don't have attackers anymore, and they have to start looking at attacking with things like Sylveon and stuff, which, again, they don't want to do because you can also devolve them. Um, so, yeah, Buzzwall is without a doubt a really, really strong card. Um, I just think, it again, it needs to be slightly ironed out for it to make it any higher onto this list. Um, its damage output, despite being a fighting type and having a 160 damage attack, actually can just not quite see it through till the end of the game, which is why pairing it with Trash Arch Garb is a really, really nice partner, um, because this is this is the, like Joe said, this is the best late game card we have right now, and just this is what's going to push it the push those last two prizes. When we're running Garb anyway, it makes a lot of sense to um, try and fit in some Rainbows and some Trash Launches as well, but yeah, I think Buzzwall will be pretty popular in London, um, and that Psychic Weakness should definitely not sort of put you off the card at all, uh, because you really, really can still apply a lot of pressure and just a quick note as well uh for those of you who don't follow the omnipoke facebook page we have three different builds of boswell garb on the page and uh yes. our lists are all still pretty close after like you know between us like 100 games of testing so yeah check those out if you're not following the facebook yeah definitely next up we have galissabod garb uh kind of a deck that's been around since worlds and just hasn't really gone anywhere um you can see by the recent performances how uh, well, why this is this is so far? Right? We've got a top eight in Brazil, a top eight in Vancouver with two more in top thirty-two, a top eight in Hartford with five more uh, Galisopod style variants being in top thirty-two, and then obviously it did win in Bremen and top forward and four more in top thirty-two. 
Uh, so yeah, Galispod Garb has definitely proved itself as an archetype at this point, and is still really, really strong. It was really, really under the radar, to be fair. Um, I think a lot of people are talking about Buzzwall, talking about Drampa, and it feels like a lot of people have forgotten about Galispod, uh, where they really shouldn't have. Galispod is still a really, really strong attacker. First impression for one energy doing 120 is crazy, crazy efficient. And having 210 HP on top of that just means that you can really ace a rollabout, which seems to be more and more relevant going into the uh, format right now. Being able to deny prizes is one of the best ways of seeing yourself through a game. Favorables, Greninja, obviously, is a really, really favorable matchup. First impression, uh, doing or just being able to one-shot Froakies uh, is really, really nice. You don't even need the movement, which is fun. Uh, but having uh, item lock, uh, ability lock, sorry, as well, is really, really nice uh, for when they do start to get established. Uh, Vika Bulu, again, because you can bounce so much, it is really annoying for them to deal with. Um, plus, you have things like crossing cut, forcing them to hit Guzmas as well uh, to be able to, well, after taking a knockout, they have to then hit things like Guzma as well as sort of finding that energy attachment and finding that choice band again to try and one-shot a Galissapod. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still really, really annoying for them to do. And similarly with Zoroark, it's just, Galissapod, I think, feels like a very, very similar attacker to Zoroark, a very cheap attacker that does a lot of damage. Obviously, Zoroark has that really strong ability, um, but we have ability lock, plus we're able to, again, cycle a little bit better than them. Um, one energy is obviously a lot nicer to deal with than a DCE because you, they can only run four DCE in their deck, whereas things like uh, Rainbow Count for us as well. And as you can see in those top decks, a fourth grass energy right now um, to be able to deal with being able to ace a roll of bounce, plus get rid of, sort of not have to worry about th all of these E-hammers that are slowly seeing play and things like Righteous Edge and stuff. Having that fourth grass energy just means that we're nowhere near as worried about things like that. Uh, Ferrimosa is another really, really nice attacker as well. Um, fast Raiders will steal you games sometimes, which is fun against uh, the odd deck here and there. Plus, being able to have a really, really strong um, GX attack is a really, really nice sort of option to have if you're not able to find Garbodor and sort of find the Rainbow Energy and things like that. Having that fourth grass energy in combination with Ferrimosa uh, means that you have another late game attacker, which is fun. Unfavorables. Obviously, Volk is unfavorable. They apply a lot of pressure anyway, but they also have weakness on you, so uh, their pressure is doubled, which is a lot of fun to deal with. Uh, but that's the thing with Galissapod Garb. That's the only unfavorable... Me and Joe sat here for about five minutes and we're like, there's no more unfavorables than Volcanion. Volcanion is a horrible matchup, but other than that, you're pretty you're pretty happy with any other Pokemon your opponent turns over. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's. I think it's definitely proved itself in winning Bremen. But I also think it's very under the radar, which is really, really weird because, as you, as we've just said, it's a deck that doesn't theoretically have any particularly bad matchups. So it should be one of the best decks in format right now, uh, which is why we've placed it all the way up at three. It's definitely deserving of its uh, number three spot, I think. Yeah, this again has been a deck that I've been testing loads. Uh, I'm super impressed with it. Even Volcanion's winnable if you know how to deal with it, although it's not great for you. Going back to the Ferramosa, yes, the GX attack is insane. Uh, for helping you close out games, which is excellent. But because you play Tapu Koko and you play three Wimpout Wimpods, this can actually be a turn 160 damage for you, which is so insane at setting up numbers for first impression as well. It makes this deck even more aggressive. And having the turn one attachment on Ferramosa will never really punish you, because uh, especially if you can go into like Guzma plays the following turn, you can keep that energy around on the board. And it's so insane to have that set on the bench. They have to deal with the Ferramosa before dealing with other things around your board. And it really makes things very difficult for people. Uh, so I think that could definitely be a great one of if you can get your hands on it. And you can just bridge it into it. Get those early pokes. Even the 30 damage pokes helps out a lot for first impression. If you play four choice bands, you can go into that 150. Uh, that's really nuts. So Fast Raid is actually like an insanely good attack for Glissopod. Uh, and the GX attack is cream on top uh, for helping you dish out these final knockouts as well alongside the Trash Avalanche, which can also get you there in the late game. So a little bit inconsistent. I know a lot of people have headaches over Glissopod Garbador that it's two stage ones. It's sort of a tug of war trying to get it all working at times. Uh, but I still feel like the power level of this deck is still really super high. And I think, as we've said, Volk is your only bad matchup and you'll always be in the game is such a great thing to have going into London and let your skill do the work and get you through a long day. Next up, we have the best Dram uh, the best Garbador variant, and that is going to be Drampa. 
now pretty much we've merged Drampa and Espeon Garb together after having played either or for so long. It seems like most players are going straight down the middle, playing a 1-1 or sometimes 2-2 Espeon GX line and having 2-3 Drampas now and then just having thick Garbador. This has been doing well everywhere. It won in Brazil with three more in top eight. Came top four in Vancouver and Hartford with plenty more in the top 32 in both circumstances and also came second in Bremen as well as claiming a top four spot. So we know this has been doing insane. Uh, many people have been adopting Tord's approach from Bremen where they're playing a 1-1 Espeon GX line and uh, that's been serving a lot of people well because the Divide GX is amazing for a Devolve approach against Gardevoir which is you know, not your best matchup, but when you have the Devolve plays available with Potown and with Divide, it's very manageable. And uh, also it means that you have the Psychic Attack, which is also very good against the Fire Style decks. And just at the very least, you have Psybeam, which slows down pretty much everything into your pace. And Drampa Garbador is a great pace setter deck because once you slow things down into a progression where Drampa is just announcing Berserk every time, you're in a great spot and you're drawing the game out as long as possible to force your opponent to dig through their deck, play a bunch of items, and guess what? At that point in the game, Trash Arch is going to be insane. And this is essentially the most efficient and most... Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, consistent list of Garbodor because you have the big wheel to fall back on. Oftentimes people are playing a ninth draw supporter card, be it a Lily or be it a Halla. And the big wheel itself is just a big consistency boost. So I think this is probably the most consistent build of garb you can go for. And consistency is always going to be a big thing people look towards when going to an event as big as London. For favourables, I mean, this really doesn't tell a tale. Vikabulu and Decidueye, these are the ones that are outright favourable. But Drampa Garbador feels like the 50-50 or better deck. And uh, I think Zorok is the only unfavourable, which is still manageable with Potown, with Righteous Edge, and just trying to be cautious... Um, I think you can win just about anything. So Drampa Garb, again, it's just so powerful. It's got the placements to back it up, and so many people will be playing it in London. It would be an injustice to not put this at the second spot. For me as well, something that could be worth testing if you're definitely going to be playing Drampa Garb and you have these next few days, try cutting the Espeon GX and just going for two Latios as well. Um, this is something that I've sort of looked at a little bit. You also have to play Special Charge if you're going to do that because the DCs go that much quicker when you're committing them to Latios, but um, that's also a really good way of helping out against the fighting weakness, and again, it's a bit more consistent than a 1-1 Espeon. You're a little bit weaker against uh, the fire stuff, but I still think that Latios could be a direction to go into, so a bit more food for thought for the uh, Drampa Guard players, but yeah, it's an incredible and very safe deck to play. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Drampa Guard over the past two weeks. I'm also playing uh, Latios. I'm actually playing it slightly differently. I'm trying Latios with a 1-1 Espeon, mm -hmm. uh, which is just trying trying to jam it all in together. Uh, but the deck feels so, so safe, which is just exactly what you want. I said earlier on how um, potentially free, quote-unquote, free points, how many free points you can get from London. And when, that kind of si when you're put in that kind of situation, you want to play something that isn't going to clunk out on you and just annoy you all day. It's a deck that will get set up Obviously, there are. Uh, it is a bit of a combo deck to get that Berserk turn two, but as long as you kind of hit Energy and Trubbish on turn one, it's not too much to ask for for the next turn to be able to get into that huge 180 Berserk, which is just so much pressure. It's insane. Having the versatility of Espeon as well, having that Divide GX is really, really strong. Um, so yeah, I don't have much more to say about Drumper Garb just because it's proved itself ever since it was first released it, or first sort of saw play in May. It's been good ever since, and it still is going to do huge things in London. Without a doubt, it's going to be, I think, the second most popular deck, only to Gardevoir, which, if you haven't worked out yet, is our number one pick for London. Gardevoir GX is, I think, kind of proved itself to be the best deck in format right now. It won Worlds, and it was a different format, but the fact the deck won Worlds is still something to think about. But then look at those recent performances. Second place in Brazil. First, second, top four, and top eight in Vancouver, with nine more in top 32. And then a top eight in Hartford with seven more in top 32, and a top eight in Brome with eight more in top 32. That's so much representation, it's insane. Like, people know this deck is good. Sylveon is now the sort of state standard, st more standard build, rather than um, sort of 
Vulpix and slash Deancy, things like that. Um, but yeah, Sylveon is kind of the build that people have moved towards. Being able to plea your opponent in certain matchups is game winning, especially in the mirror. If you can time the plea right, it is in like in insanely good how strong plea is in that matchup. The favorables, as you can see there, um, again, these are all kind of low tier picks, it, five and below. Um, but the, it's another deck that has naturally still decent matchups against the rest of the decks. It still feels like a pretty safe 50-50-ish deck just because of how strong Guardi is as a card. The, it, the damage output is really, really, really strong and it's kind of difficult to deal with um, when your opponent does set up two Guardies. There's not many things you could be playing that won't just begin to lose prizes at that point. Unfavorables. Greninja has always been unfavorable. The fact that they are a non-EX with theoretically 180 HP, uh, meaning you need six energy between you, uh, but they only ever have one or zero on them, is really, really difficult for you to deal with because your ability locked, so you can't Secret Spring to ramp into the one-shot knockouts. Uh, obviously, Greninja can be a slow deck, so you can get to the point where you can build up two Guardies um, that are dealing enough damage. Uh, but if you're building up two Guardies to deal enough damage, in pretty much any matchup, you're going to win anyway. So Greninja just forces you to do that, whereas other matchups, you can have a bit a bit of a slower progression anyway. And then Buzzwell Garb. They have Ability Lock as well as the Devolve Package, and that's kind of the thing you don't really want to see, uh, because Ability Lock means that you can't apply pressure quickly and finish the game, um, and then that means they're going to be able to do enough damage to Devolve you with Buzzwell, uh, with Buzzwell and the Espeon combo. Uh, so they slow the game down enough to be able to set up a board state where they just have to announce Miraculous Shine for pretty much the win. Uh, so Buzzwell Garb is a bit of an awkward matchup because they do have, ideally, the perfect sort of devolve um, package because they managed to fit in uh, uh, Ability Lock as well. But there are ways around that. Third Field Blower and Second Parallel, um, I think, are two of the weaker ways to do that, but still two very, very important cards in general. Uh, but things like Max Potion and Mr. Mime are seeing more and more play right now, and that is how you stop things like Buzzwall dealing lots of little pokes to your board to be able to devolve you later on. Max potioning them away is really, 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 really strong. Plus, having access to Max Potion in the mirror is really, really good. Uh, it means that often you're forcing your opponent to overcommit to Guardies whilst you're able to just have one or two energy on, take a hit, swipe, swipe off the damage with a Max Potion, and Secret Spring back on to be able to deliver a knockout and sort of force your opponent to build up another strong Guardie uh, to respond with, which is how you win the matchup. You force your opponent to build a big guardy, and you just sort of take the tempo, take the initiative like that. So yeah, things like Max Potion are really, really strong, not only for Buzzwall and Devolve style things, but the Mirror as well. And then, as I mentioned, Mr. Mime, just stopping Buzzwall completely uh, is really, really strong. You don't have any way... that, well, they, The only way they get around that is by establishing Garb. And if you're playing Third Blower... Um, they're, they have to sort of, they're already applying 30 damage before you're uh, re-establishing re your Mr. Mime, meaning that they have to find another tool for their Garbador. So it's forcing more resources out of them. And Guardi is a deck that just can out-resource people because it does so efficient damage. Um, it can it can really ramp into huge knockouts. So yeah, it's without a doubt the best deck in format right now, I think. And it's crazy if you're not at least considering this deck. Um or testing against it because you're going to see multiple Guardies throughout the day. Yeah, Guardi is absolutely incredible. I think the more I've played it, begrudgingly, I really don't like playing stage 2 decks, but begrudgingly I've started playing this deck and it is just so impressive. Like, my win rate is pretty insane with Guardi. Um, the hipster I am, I actually am not a huge fan of Sylveon. <laughs> I play the, uh, the Vulpix build, uh, but that's because it allows me to fit in Mimes, Max Potions, and the third field blower. I think uh, not everyone's going to be able to fit all those techs in, but I grit my teeth and said, I don't need Magical Ribbon, I don't need Plea. And that list is still doing very well for me. So I think there's still going to be both forms of Guardi, but I would assume that you're going to see a lot more Sylveon. Parallel Plea is just insane. It's great against Greninja. It's great against any bad matchup. Uh, great against Mirror as well. So uh, yeah, it's just really crazy that you can catch people out with the Plea as an option. And even when you're adding people and yourself to a low hand size, you can weave in a magical ribbon and set yourself up for game as well, as long as they didn't hit like one of their only ends remaining in their deck from like two or three cards. So um, Sylveon does provide a lot. Gallade is insane as well, by the way. Um, he's really impressing me. His premonition is great, but just 
as a non ex attacker he is absolutely insane even better in the sylveon list because uh he'll skew the prize trade for you whereas in the vulpix list he is oftentimes a liability um but yeah with sylveon he will skew the prizes in the mid game whilst dealing good damage whilst you're setting up guardies on your bench as well so so many good boxes to tick his fighting weakness is so much more relevant now that there's zoroark and there's potentially still valley around as well so um just all around this deck covers so many bases and despite it being a stage two that can be devolved can be weak to po town can be weak to garbador um it has plenty of answers and uh it's still just one of these beat stick cards that hits so hard with that much hp it simply cannot be ignored so pretty much we're both accepting that this is the best deck in format i think i think everyone's accepted it at this point and uh, it will most likely be the most popular deck in london so let's move on to outside the top 10 just a few more considerations uh, we really think that the format is actually quite narrow it was actually difficult for me to make this top 10 um, <laughs> it was almost generous to have like the ninth and 10th slots in there because it feels like if you're not playing a garbador list a guardy list or one of the other new cards or volk um you're gonna have a bad day <laughs> a lot of the time so we'll just really quickly go over some of these things i'll kick it off with salazzle hoto um, I think at this point we're agreed that Volk is almost definitely the better archetype. Kiar weighing onto Ho is not as good as it used to be. Um, Guardi typically will have the means to win, and uh, pretty much every other deck will as well. Every deck that plays DC Lele can just beat this deck essentially. So I think this deck shouldn't be approached for London. Yeah, and similarly with Xerneas, with so much Guardi uh, play, like in Sylveon playing you. Uh, Xerneas actually it makes Guardia a bad matchup unless you're incredibly experienced with the deck which there are like multiple people that have been piloting it for months that know how to now uh, play around plea but if you're just picking up Xerneas uh, for this tournament I think it's going to be um, a difficult day because plea is really really difficult to deal with you can't spread your energy too much because they can parallel plea all but two of your card or to all but two of your Pokemon um, so you, but then you can't stack onto multiple because they can actively target that with the plea, or they or that just plays into Guardi's strategy anyway, and they're attacking you for one energy while still getting a knockout, whereas you're having to have multiple energy on the board whilst losing a lot at the same time. So yeah, the fact that parallel plea is now the um, kind of standard build of Guardi uh, means that Xerneas is a pretty rough pick, I think, for London. Uh, which is unfortunate because I never really got to play this deck, but <laughs> I think it's um, not the best time right now. Parallel Plea is just too difficult to deal with a lot of the time. Yeah, it's dead. Uh, Metagross GX, I feel personally that uh, if you're going to play a deck trying to outright have a great Gardevoir, you could play other decks that are just better around the board. You could play a Decidueye build that has really good Devolve. You could play Boswell Garb as a great Devolve package with Garbodor. Or you could just play Sylvan uh, Valley Metals. I think all of these have more positive uh, Gardevoirs than Metagross itself does. I think mm -hmm. Metagross can do this big old healing approach. I think if you play four Max Potion, four Field Blower, and just go as simple as possible. My PTCGO list actually is only two lines. That's a fun fact. Uh, so that shows <laughs> you how many four obs I play in that deck. It's just as simple as it can be. And I think that's the way you would only ever play Metagross. But as long as people are playing parallel plea it's even close against guardi so i think uh not the best way to counter gardevoir in the format and therefore probably not the best pick either yeah and finally galispod zoroark uh, this is actually probably the archetype that gets the most respect from me because it's i've seen it win games recently whereas the other, th other three i feel are a lot weaker um but personally to me it feels like a bit of a worse galispod garbador zoroark does something very different to garbador and with things like Mind ja uh, sorry, Stand In, uh, Glispod is a really, really strong card still. Um, but I think overall it just does feel a little, a little bit weaker on the whole. You have Trickster GX um, to be able to, to, as your closer perhaps. But it feels like uh, overall they're both very early game based cards, uh, doing a lot of pressure for early, um, for for low energy costs. Uh, but without the Garbodor, I feel like the deck struggles to close out games, and I feel like Zoroark isn't a particularly good um, Pokemon for doing that. Obviously, you do have trades to be able to uh, avoid things like low, uh, end, like late game ends, um, to to sort of set up a situation where you're still 
you're you're taking a two hit knockout for a game, uh, but sort of when you're getting end to two, if you've got a Garbador with an energy on board, you're winning the game anyway. So it still feels worse overall, I think, than Galisapod Garb. Uh, but I think this is the archetype that gets the most respect from me out of the four on the screen. That's so weird. I don't respect the archetype at all <laughs> because <laughs> I think it's it's two cards that do the same thing basically. So yeah. I would just play straight Zoroark and try and cover my weakness to fighting in other ways than just playing another stage one that does exactly the same thing. Anyway, let's not get into it. So <laughs> that is going to be our list, guys. And uh, now we're going to ask each other. What deck would we play if we had any pick? And also, if we had to pick a deck, a new archetype from Shining Legends and Crimson Invasion, what would we go for? So, Jack, start us off with the new archetype that you would pick. Uh, new archetype would probably be Buzz Garb, just because it's the deck I've put the most time into of the new archetypes. And Buzz is so much like Landorus. Uh, I can't help but love the card. Um, I'm kind of going off it a little bit the more I test it, but it's still definitely up there. Uh, for decks I'm potentially playing for London without a doubt, just because the fighting type as well as sort of the natural style of the deck is so good right now. Uh, so yeah, it'd definitely be Buzz Garb, and there's a lot of things that I like about the deck. Oh, you ninja my pick. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go for Decidueye Zoroark because I think it's probably the best ability deck out there outside of Guardi, and it has a good yeah. Guardi, so... Yeah, that seems like a really good deck, and you'll yeah. definitely have fun in London if you play that deck, because you get to draw it to cards, you get to put damage all over the board, and you can really have a long day of just lots of thinking and decision-making. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Desi Zoro seems like a really fun play. Yeah. Uh, for my any pick, a lot of people... Oh, I've had so many people asking me if I'm playing Guardi, but I think I'd pick Drampa right now. I think Guardi does have a very big target on its back, and whilst the inherent strength of the deck is insane, I'd still I'm still considering Guardi because the deck is, in my eyes, leagues about leagues into tier one like tier one. It's insane. I really really think it's strong, but it feels like it does have a bit of a target on its back. And whilst Drampa Garb is going to be a matchup everyone's testing as well, it's another really really consistent deck. Um, Guardi is a stage two deck, so it does have those odd games where you do do stage two things. Uh, where and I, I have played games with Drampa Garb where it has done sort of one Pokemon six energy, but a any deck can do that. It feels like Drampa is a really really consistent build, and as we mentioned when talking about London earlier on, it feels like consistency is going to be king. Just to net that top 128 for those cheeky 100 points ready for Worlds. And for me, I would also stick with a Garbodor build. I'd go with Galissapod. I think. Uh... Again, tried and tested. We know basically a regionals ready list. Um, and uh, it's a little bit under the radar. I think a lot of people won't be playing Volk because of fear of Guardi, which is, you know, rightfully so. Which means that Glissopod basically has a lot of 50-50s or better. So it's probably very safe for getting you into the high rankings um, and maybe get you into those points as well. So I think Glissopod Garb also a great play for London. So yeah. that is going to wrap it up, guys. Uh, another long discussion, another top 10 list. Let us know what you guys think down below. What are you going to be playing for London? What do you expect to be the most popular decks? What do you need to counter? Have we gone crazy with this list? Is there something that's <laughs> way out of place? Have we been underselling, overselling, or simply forgetting an archetype that you guys are going to be bringing to the tournament? I'd love to hear it all down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and uh, leave likes and comments to the video as you've already said and jack is there anything else we need to say other than that make sure you come and say hi to both me and joe in london um we we really enjoyed london last year and it's going to be an insanely good tournament especially if um there are 700 plus people playing so yeah make sure you enjoy yourself it's going to be a lot of fun and as i said come say hi to me and joe um yeah it's going to be a really great weekend but yeah i think other than that uh thank you very much for watching I have been Jack with Joe from Omnipoke and we look forward to seeing you guys in London and in another video very, very soon.